It's a pleasure for me to introduce you, Dr. Ramon Aurell. He's the medical director of the fertility units in the Tecnon Medical Center and the Quiron Salud Barcelona Hospital. He has participated in several projects, conferences, and sessions, in addition to being published in prestigious national and international journals and books. With his dynamism, effectiveness, sensitivity, and striving to offer the best to couples, he aims to create a leading unit on both the domestic and international stages. He is international speaker and has been lecturing and visiting IVF clinics all over the world. Please, Dr. Ramon Aurel, you can make the presentation, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, first of all, I, I have to thank you, um, uh, Waterfalls, for this magnific magnificent opportunity to uh, basically opening this lecturing. Uh, I didn't know it was going to be a sort of worldwide opportunity, so I'm really glad to be the one opening this, uh, this journey that I'm sure is going to be very grateful for, for you from the other side of, of the world and for us here in Quiron Salud. As a medical director of the um, IVF setup here in Quiron Salud Barcelona, uh, when, I, when Carlos was asking me what can I offer, to uh, the audience, I presume majority will be gynecologists or training in IVF. It's basically what has changed in the 21st century on the fertility uh, approach to the patients and of course, as a modern approach. Uh, you all know very well that over 35 years ago was the, the first baby through IVF was born in the UK and after that, in 35 years, we passed from having a 10% pregnancy rate per cycle to uh, community pregnancy rates today of nearly 90%. So really, we, we made it really, uh, really big. And the changes we have in the last 10 years, I hope I'm going to summarize that in the next 20 or 25 minutes. As Carlos introduced to, the, to you, we have uh, four general hospitals in the area in Barcelona with two big consultation areas and two IBF laboratories with uh, continuous education, efficiency and continuous um, improvement. And if you look at our activity uh, in the last 10 years, we did nearly 10, 10 cycles of uh, reproductive medicine between IVF, uh, insemination, fertility preservation, and of course, on the egg donation program. Um, I really like this slide because today when a patient comes to the clinic, normally the first thing they ask you is, uh, what are my chances of getting pregnant once, you know, I have the treatment with you? I keep telling them that, that, that if you are sort of a good prognostic patient, that you are, you know, less than 35, that we have more than 10 expert stimulation cycle, and we manage to get you more, more four or five blastocysts, your chances of pregnancy will be, as you can see in the screen, well over 90%. And I think that tells you through the, uh, the lecture I'm going to give you, how can you achieve that if you really select with your patients and you have the best technology that we have available? But let's go to the, to the point of the major changes. I thought a lot of those are very embryological, but they change a lot on our IVF working in the last 10 years. Vitrification, as you know, is a new sort of uh, freezing technology. The pre-implantation genetic test that will go there in two or three slides for you to understand when we have to give it, do it, and, and the results that we have. The freeze all strategy, that how, how in the last sort of 10 years, we don't have risk of hyperstimulations anymore with these new freeze all strategies. Then the protocols, when I, I went to uh, the Emirates uh, in February before the COVID and all my talks all over the world, how we have changed the way we stimulate the patients, the protocols we use, and the dosage to give, you know, the best results at the end of the day. And again, what is in technology, the, the best thing we have nowadays is the uh, continuous embryo monitoring through the culture systems and the time lapse that we have in our labs here in Barcelona. If you look at this slide um, on the left-hand side, you can see that more than 50% of the transfers are not done on a fresh cycle anymore. So that's because vitrification give us as the opportunity to, to have nearly same results or best results with frozen embryo than on a fresh embryo. So we are now passing from 
freezing only about 9% of the cases to freeze more than 35% of our IBF cycles. And why is good vitrification? Of course, vitrification gives you uh, the possibility of the biopsy embryos on day five. And again, if you look at the, at the red colors at the end and the results of this low freezing through the vitrification, you can see vitrification has really given you, I'm trying to see if I can point you here. Uh, no. If you look at the 2018 vitrification slide, the pregnancy rates are nearly double on what we have with this low freezing technology. What, that's why vitrification is very good. And why is good vitrification? In the, these three things that I'm um, marking here, of course, in the pre-implantation genetic test, in the uh, frozen embryo replacement treatments, and of course, in the vitrification of all sites for oncology cases or social freezing in younger population. What about the PGTA on day five, the pre-implantation genetic test? Uh, again, in the next sort of five to 10 years, we increased 30% the number of patients that had PGTA normally because the patients we have here are over 38. I don't know in your population in the Emirates, but now in our clinics, 80% of our patients are over 38. So really, we have to offer them the best chance having a normal haploid embryo and get have, having then more uh, success rates. But again, PGTA on day five is not only better pregnancy rates. Of course, you will decrease little embryos. You transfer one at a time. So you're increasing the pregnancy rates well over 12%, from a 48.2% to 60%. And again, what's more, more important in Europe, decreasing multiple rates by 15%, coming down to 5%. Remember 10 years ago, before freezing, before vitrification and slow free and, and, and stimulation with PGTA, we, with Greece and Italy, have a 25% pregnancy rate that's going down dramatically thanks to the pre-implantation genetic test. And again, I always say to the patients, the, the PGTA is not going to change the embryo. The embryo is what you, get, you have with your egg and your sperm, but the guarantee of transferring a healthy embryo increases the chance of a pregnancy over 60 or 65 percent. And again, in recent papers, I'm sure you've seen that in probably in the next year or two years, we'll have the non-invasive and testing. We don't have to laser the embryos anymore, and we can see the euploidy or neoploidy of these embryos in the culture media. There's a lot of uh, studies running at the moment with, of course, the both techniques to make sure that it's going to be safe and effective in the near future. If we go to the freeze-all strategy, as I told you, we are freezing now 16 or 20 percent more than we did five years ago, back in 2014. Why is that? As I said before, with the freeze-all strategy, we're going to avoid the hyperstimulation risks that I'm sure in your country you have a lot of young population with PCO uh, ovary, and the risk of the concerns of hyperstimulating is very high. So with this technology, you will avoid this. We have less risk, more efficiency, and more efficacy. Remember, we, in Spain, we're doing 70% of the egg donations from the European countries, from France, from Italy, from Germany, from England. Uh, now, with the COVID, of course, we, we have to manage to, to make the blastocyst travel, but that's a problem for all the countries in the world. But again, we are experts in this freezer strategy and, of course, of avoiding the hyperstimulation for the egg donation. Uh, young girls. The endometrium preparation is much better. You don't have to concern as much as the progesterone, of course. We now measure progesterone before the embryo transfer, but we're not as concerned with the fresh embryo transfer as we were before. And again, uh, it's beneficial, of course, not for everybody, but definitely for more than 15 or such when you have a risk clear of hyper stimulation, uh, stimulating the patient. And if you look, our, our first attempt after freeze all the pregnancy rates are much, much higher and over 60% of the cases. But probably in the audience, I presume majority of you doctors are colleagues are gynecologists and you're more concerned on the stimulation. And I'm sure you agree that um, we've moved completely from um, to individualized and personalized stimulation protocols. 
We move from agonists to antagonists. We don't do agonist cycles anymore for the risk of hyperstimulations. We increase the use of the LH at back, the medication that helps, especially in aging population patients who are in uh, a low uh, ovarian reserve. Recombinant FSH alone, or combination with recombinant LH, to maximize the quantity and the quality of the oocytes. I don't know in your country, in the Emirates, but in Spain, we have six major companies now giving different recombinant FSH, or LH, urinary um, HMG, and again, the biosimilars. Uh, if you are strict to the, what's uh, scientifically proven, what is genetically created, so the recombinant FSH-LH should have more purity, more efficacy, and again, if you have more oocyte at the end of the stimulation, better pregnancy rates. We managed to synchronize the follicular stimulation with the OCP, the estradiol priming before the stimulation, that's a way of doing that. And again, with the final trigger on the follicular maturation, with the agonist instead of the HCG, in the cases that you're clear that you're not having a hypo hypo patient or a severe PCO patient, will avoid the hyperstimulation syndrome. We move from, move from the mild uh, to mini stimulation that we had in the Northern European countries 10 years ago to the super stimulation. We now know very well that if you have more oocytes, 15, 20, 25, you will get more embryos and of course more aeoploids and again, a better all success pregnancy rates. Again, we move from the multiple pregnancy to tri trouble, uh, triple or double to a single embryo transfer and improve the embryo transfer techniques with the scan and all these very echo-guided embryo transfer guides that you can see with the catheter very well where you put the embryo. We move from the intramuscular painful uh, progesterone to the vaginal um, dose or route that it's easy, of course, for the patient, self-administered and little side effects. And again, we're all looking for safety, efficacy, and efficiency. That's what I think we have to give to all our patients. How do we move to individualization and personalized stimulation of protocols? I mean, I think we all, you all have again in your country the same as we do here in Europe, the three top biomarkers to predict ovarian uh, response. The age is very important. You can do whatever you want. You can have whatever you do. But over 38, 40 years of age, again, the chances are much less. Antimullerian hormone is important, but remember, always has to go together with the antral follicular count. You cannot believe an antimullerian hormone is going to give you the clue, because if you've seen in different papers, you can have a same lady having antimullerian in three different labs, and this poor lady having a higher AMH, normal AMH or lower AMH. So really, you have to see uh, on the scan how many follicles you have in both the ovaries, and again, to predict the ovarian response. And again, you have to find the best protocol for each patient's profile. You have to be able to predict the ovarian reserve. You have to be able to choose the right protocol to start the right dose, because remember, the dose you start on day one is the one that's going to follow the follicular growing of the follicles. We used to start at the beginning doing this uh, increased dose or lowering the dose. No, it's been all proven today that the, the first dose you give on day one it's going to reclude the maximum number of follicles, and that's what you're going to get in, of course, the whole stimulation protocol. And again, try to choose the right drug. As I said, in Spain, we have many, many different ones. All the companies are good. You have more or less same results, but again, you have to try to give what you think is best scientifically uh, with Cochrane database and literature setups, what's best for your patient. And I'm sure you will agree with, with me here. The more oocytes you have, uh, the more embryos we, you will get. And then remember, on the slide number three, the better cumulative pregnancy rate you will have. Um, and the important message here is how quick can you get this woman pregnant? Again, with safety, but efficacy will be the time for this woman to have a baby. You all know very well this graphic from Shesh Shunkara, a very good friend of mine when I trained in the UK. Shesh has very clear that if you look at uh, the age ratio, 15 should be or will be the ideal number of eggs. So we must find the right balance. It's okay if you get 20, 25, or 30, but then you have to for sure freeze all that cycle to avoid hyperstimulation, uh, severe hyperstimulating uh, this patient. But if you have 15 or less, 
unless your estradiol level is very high, it's a very thin women and you, you, you concern, then you can go, of course, for uh, a, 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 an embryo transfer. But always remember that you have to collect what you have in the ovaries, but without com compromising or uh, safety must be your paramount. We all have patients that have between 35 and 55 eggs, but that should be avoided. Because again, the more eggs you have, you have more embryos. Yes, but again, the risk for the patients could be also very important. In this graphic, you'll see very well the way we individualize the treatment, depending on, of course, the antimolarian you have and your follicular count, the dose you will start, again, 150 if it's a normal uh, high responder, 225 if it's normal or on the lower side, and again, over 300 if it's a high res uh, low responder. Understanding all of you that it doesn't matter if you give 300, sorry, 400, 500. It's well demonstrated that above 300, it doesn't change at all, and it's going to give you more eggs. So you don't have to risk or to give more medication. It's expensive for the patient. Age is very important. As I said, in Europe, I'm sure you have the same as we do here in, in, in Spain. The age of the patient is very important. We have more than 80% of our patients are over 38. And if you look in this graphic, the pregnancy per cycle in these patients won't be more than 20, 25%. And I like this uh, New York Times Magazine four years ago. The patients know, they know very well that they can get pregnant at any age. But for us, responsibility is a must. We, in Spain, we don't have a policy giving you the, the limit on the age of the woman. But again, 50 should be ideally the age that we use for this patient. I like this graphic very much. It helps us to work on the daily basis. If you look at the women of, after the age of 38, that's when I think, think pre-implantation genetic tests for the embryo should be employed when you have more than 50% of an aeoploidy. If you tell a patient age 38, 37, 38, 39, that more than 50% of the embryos that you have, if they could be type A embryo, beautifully, a, a blast, blastocyst, but more than 50% of those embryos will be abnormal, genetically speaking. If you do the genetic test, you then transfer an aeoploid embryo, and the success rate will go over, so there's 20% if you don't do the test, over 60, 65% if you do the PGTA. And um, Filippo Baldi just led me this, uh, this slide. I think it's very interesting. If you look, and that's very important for your day-to-day -day clinic, and I think I'm going to copy-paste that for us. If you have a patient 35 or less, and you want to guarantee an aeoploid blastocyst, remember, 60% rate of aeoploidy, you'll need five mature oocytes to get an aeoploid blastocyst on a 35-year-old woman. But what happens if you want to get an aeoploid blastocyst in a... 39, 40-year-old women. Look at the aeoploid rate, 30%. You know in this lady that only, only from 10 embryos, three will be, genetically speaking, normal. So you need to have at least nine mature oocytes to have seven fertilized embryos, and then three blastocysts to get one aeoploid blastocyst. So really, it's not easy to get there. And again, what's more concern for us, if you have ladies from over 42, 43, that you have to convince how difficult it's going to be to get an aeoploblastocyst if you tell them that only 20% will be normal. So from 10 embryos, only one or two will be aeoploid. She needs to have 16 mature oocytes. And that's in this age ratio is really difficult. And that's when egg donation enters the scenario. So I think this graphic helps us to, to explain the patient how pre-implantation genetic tests on the aeoploid, on the embryo, to have one aeoploid embryo can help you to get them pregnant. What about the, the, the medication, the stimulation protocols? Uh, you all have the concerns if you use recombinant LH, if you recombinant FSH, if you uh, use urinary drugs, if you use uh, biosimilars that we have now in Spain from different companies. I'm sure you all agree from the scientific point of view that the recombinant, the recombinant so genetic created drugs will maximize the quantity and the quality of the oocyte. Maybe only one, one oocyte. Have you seen a lot of papers? But one oocyte in a 41-year-old woman or 42-year-old woman can make a big difference. And as just a big summary for you to, to get all the picture together. Uh, I, the, I was thinking the other day, how can I summarize for you the, the goal that we all have for these uh, this women to, to shorten the take-home baby rate in an IVF cycle? Again, 
if you are very critical in the clinical approach or strategies for every patient, the antagonist, the right drug, preventing cycle cancellation, that's a burden and upsetting the patient a lot. Or the laboratory technology that we are very lucky to have in this country, I'm sure you do have as well, the time-lapse facilities, embryo culture technology, uh, the traceability, and again, all the stability that you need in IVF laboratory. Again, you can choose by uh, whatever programs and software and through artificial uh, intelligence in, in embryology, the best embryo to transfer. And again, uh, the patient outcome should be always uh, to have increasing efficacy and in, in, in uh, trying to decrease the treatment discontinuation. And with the antagonist, I'm sure you agree that the duration of the treatment has less. You uh, need a little injection, no sniffing, you just inject the antagonist from day six of the cycle. Again, the protocols, the cycles can start one after the other. If the first cycle is failed, you can do a dual stimulation in the same month or start from day one of the period, second cycle, and again, nearly reduce by none the hyperstimulation symptom. That was a big concern for all of us. And all this will attribute and shorten the time to live birth. So, little cancellation, best toler toler tolerability, so little um, side effects, and a minimum dropout rate. This is very important because the dropout rate, of course, will burden the patients and uh, stop cancelling or producing cycles anymore. And again, the measure I said to an IVF cycle, well, is to get your patients pregnant, to get a cumulative life birth rate per started cycle. You know very well that the more eggs you have, if you look when you have more than 16 eggs retrieved, you should be able to get over 67% pregnancy rates. So the efficacy is the fresh plus the frozen embryos. If you look at the, uh, the best recombinant FSH, again, you have to, to be sure that you use the one that's more pure, the one that has uh, more consistency from, from batches to batches, and that's, again, the folytropin alpha. When you know that you are injecting, look at this one. Uh, if you feel by mass, if you look at the little minus plus 2%, of the dose you are giving the patient, but if you feel by BOSA and the other uh, FSH, you have to be very careful because if you think you're given uh, 60 units, you may be given only 40, or if you think you're giving 93.8 units, you may be given over 120. So it is important to know by the purity of the drug what are you giving the patient. And again, you know that very well. With the recombinant FSH, now you have more follicles, you have more oocytes, and you have more embryos. So the success rates overall will be higher. Again, you'll have a more live birth rate, rate per cycle using little gonadotrophin, the one in purple. You, you'll see that you use little units to get the same or better result. So that's why recombinant is important as well. And don't forget financially, I don't know in, in Emirates, but here we have a lot of pressure in the NHS as a public patient to give the minimum drug, the cheaper one, but to get the people pregnant better. So again, from the German registry, over half a million IVF cycles, this demonstrated that they have a better pregnancy rates and less canceled cycles with recombinant FSH compared to uh, HMG. And again, if you get, remember this paper from Philip Lehert and, and, and Diego Zcurra from Merck, that you get more oocytes from the uh, recombinant FSH and uh, significant lower uh, dose of the gonadotropin induced per cycle, again, this is a big advantage for the patient and for um, the uh, clinic. And again, just to finish, do you remember on, the, on this, the five things that I tell you that were important in the last sort of 10 years, changes in technology and drugs, we have the continuous embry moni embryo mi monitoring. In our, in our lab, because we don't have a lot of uh, continuous monitoring incubators, not for all the patients. Sometimes we have to freeze the embryos on day three, but then we put them on the incubator up to day five once we thaw them. And the pregnancy rates are much, much higher. When they get in the Gary, that's what we're using for our uh, culture uh, system to get pregnancy rates. So really, uh, the message here will be, again, to select your patients properly, to give them 
all the technology that we have available today. As you've seen, I told you at the beginning, we've changed from the 10% pregnancy rate in the 1980s to overall pregnancy rate over 90% in the year 2020. And I think that technology giving us uh, to our patients the quickest time to get to pregnancy rate. Uh, of course, freezing is important and vitrification, as I told you, but you need to have a good IVF laboratory. Vitrification, PGTA, uh, freezing embryos only will work in your laboratories if you have good technology and a good embryologist. And I think with this, I finish the presentation. Sukran, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Ramon Aurel. We will now proceed to have some questions that we received during the presentation. Please. Thank you very much. First question, doctor. Mm -hmm. How is pre-implantation genetic diagnosis performed? Okay. The PGTA technology in our laboratory is done by a laser on day five, so the embryos got into the timelines incubator from the air collection day to day five, so they're not disturbed, they're an incubator, temperature, oxygen, etc. Day five, the embryologists, the senior ones, they do a, a laser biopsy, and then the embryo gets uh, in the vitrification process, and two or three weeks later, the cell that's sent to the genetic department will give us a diagnosis of a Euploid embryo or an euploid embryo. Of course, then when we have the euploid embryo, we'll contact the patients and we'll organize the frozen replacement treatment to transfer the euploid embryo. And again, the uneuploid embryos are, of course, discharged and uh, we cannot use them anymore. Another question, doctor? Thank you. Does it make sense to use more than 300 uh, units of treatment to stimulate? It's a very good question. We all had the year about five, 10 years ago when we, we believed that 450, 500, 600 units of gonadal troppings. But again, if you look at the papers that we have recently in the last two to three years, more than 300 units are not going to give you any, any, any benefit. I personally believe that if you, if you have a patient with a very low antimolarian hormone with a follicular count less than two. So we have one or two follicles. Even a mild stimulation is very, very good to use for this patient. You don't need to, to waste money and inject 300 units when just with 75 or 150, she will respond to these one or two follicles. And remember, with the stimulation, you will get what the woman has in the ovaries. You cannot create more eggs. So really, that's what you're going to obtain. Thank you. And the last uh, question, doctor. In which situation elective vitrification is recommended? Elective vitrification of the embryos, we will, by, by uh, protocol in our clinic, if you have more than 15 eggs at the egg collection, if you have a stradiol level that we monitor every other day, over 3,000 uh, picomol uh, the day before the egg collection. But again, common sense for me is more important. And if you have a very slim patient, with 12 eggs, estradiol of 4,000 or 2,500, and you are concerned and you have a good vitrification, you better off doing the trigger with your agonist. Don't risk anything about hyperstimulation because nowadays in the 21st century, we have no excuse. We ha cannot have an hyperstimulation patient in our clinics anymore with this new technology. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Ramon. It was a pleasure to inaugurate the Thanks master classes of Curon Salud uh, Hospital Group. Um, please, doctor, note that if you have more questions, you can put in contact with Dr. Aurel and team in the mail technon.fertility at quironsalud.es. And the next uh, Quiron Salud Masterclass is going to be presented next November the 15th by Dr. Kim Casañas, Director of Traumatology Department in Tegnon Medical Center. Thank you very much for your attention and have a nice evening. Thank you. <laughs>